I'm so glad you guys made it out to this screening. We have a special Q&A for you with the filmmakers, the star, the DP. I want to bring them all up. Uh, my name is Peter de Bruges. Uh, I'm a critic for Variety. I adore this movie. I hope you share my feelings. Uh, the, and the way I want to do this, I'll ask a few questions, but I really want you guys to have a chance to ask your own, and so I'll kind of moderate a conversation with all of us, hopefully. Uh, let's bring out uh, Chloe Zhao, the director. This is her second feature. Uh, wherever you please. Sit next to me. Okay. Uh, the uh, Brady Jandro. <laughs> Hey, Brady. Welcome up. Uh, and Joshua Richards, the cinematographer of the movie. Do you want to see if he is? Uh, Alex, are you here? Alex O'Flynn? Hey, hey you so want to come join us, our editor? You want to come up as, as well? <laughs> come on down. Come on, Alex. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll stand off to the side. You guys can sit here. The... Uh, Say his name again. Who's the editor? Alex O'Flynn. Alex O'Flynn. All right. The, uh, so, Chloe, start us off by telling us how you and Brady met. Um, we met on, on a ranch in South Dakota on Pine Ridge. Um, and uh, I, I saw him, he, you know, I was in the basement. He walked in. Um, I just thought he had such a great presence. And then I saw him training horses. And he was, he was being a father and mother and a friend and a dance partner to this wild young horse. And he was able to, to play different roles to the horse to get the horse to trust him, you know. And I, I thought maybe he can do that to the audience <laughs> as well. <laughs> maybe he can act. So that's how I, I was really drawn to him before there was even a story. Yeah. So you had gone to Pine Ridge for your first feature, uh, Songs My Brothers Taught Me. Uh, and... Uh, the, and that's a film that you sort of developed in with the community, right? Uh, and in a way, that's sort of the way this came about. If anything, almost more so, because uh, the Brady's story on film is Brady's actual story. Brady, do you want to tell us a little bit about like how, uh, tell us how uh, this is sort of uh, different from what actually happened to you? Uh, I'd call it about 60% based on my true story, 40% uh, completely fiction. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's your father, that's your sister. Yeah, that's uh, my dad, uh, yeah. Tim Jandrew and Lily Jandrew, my sister. And, um, you know, uh, there are some things, though, that were added for dramatic effect, like the grocery store scenes are completely fictional because, yeah, my mom is alive. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually in the movie. She actually uh, pushes one of my horses out of the chute on... Filmed at Mitchell. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the uh, and Chloe. So, like, uh, did you use Brady in your first movie? Um, the you you worked with a lot of sort of non actors there from Pine Ridge. Um, there were three people that was in this film that was in my first one, but not Brady. I, I right. met him after the first film was already out. I okay. Was back visiting. And is uh, Brady? Is your injury as serious as it's portrayed here? I mean, is it sounds like that there's a real risk that if you ride again, you're risking your life. Oh, well, it's, it's never really directly put out there what my injury is in the film. Um, the dimensions of my injury, it was a three and a quarter inch in length commutative fracture, meaning shattered. Um, three regions of my skull were broken, and uh, it was about an inch and a quarter deep in my brain cavity, and uh, an inch in, or three quarters of an inch wide in the middle, meaning deeper in the middle than on the sides in the shape of a horse hoof. And it was contaminated. Um, it had manure and sand and hair and all kinds of stuff in there. And uh, yeah, I was I was in a coma for five days, and I woke up and pulled all my tubes out of my chest. <laughs> <laughs> the is the video that we see you watch in the movie. Is that the yeah, that's injury? That's actual footage of my head injury. Yeah. Wow. The uh, and where does that leave you today? Uh, I mean, are you? Uh, I think the last time we had a conversation, Chloe was telling me basically that we can't keep you away from horses. Yeah, I, uh, we've actually started a breeding program since the shoot called Gender Performance Horses. Uh, we have like a, a page on Facebook you can go on there and like, and 
Uh, we, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> uh, we raise American Quarter Horses all registered through the AQHA to do everything from rodeo, you know, to hunting, pleasure riding, ranch horses, everything you can think of. Yeah. And uh, I still train horses for a living every day, wild horses. <laughs> some of the most special... Thank you. Some of the most special sequences in the movie, I think, are those kind of like unbroken takes of you, uh, you know, working with horses. Are we seeing what's really happening there, or are those more tame than they look? Uh, no, those are horses I was actually taking in from clients yeah. um, to be pit, to ride for a set number of days for a set number like amount of pay, and all those horses I had to train to um, be good enough to sell at the horse sale at the end of the month. So yeah, those horses were being trained in real time. Yeah, we're watching you do your magic, really, on, on, right before our eyes. The, Chloe, can you talk about, one of the things that I found so exciting about this movie is the way that it kind of straddles this world of documentary and, and fiction. You've taken all of these real people and their real stories and, and kind of reinterpreted. But there is, like those scenes, there's an element where we're really watching uh, the the real thing kind of in front of us. Can you talk a little bit about that magic line, I guess, between... Uh, you know what you wanted to do as a poet almost and what you wanted to do as a, a documentarian um, I think the we kind of need both as a human being you know we most we need the facts but we also need poetry um, and um, I'm trying to include both in this film to to, to, to explain to you Brady's story or why he chose to stay and why he chose to risk his life to um, to keep that way of life, and um, to show you the statistics and to also like what he's dealing with so from day to day and all these things, but also the um, the much more emotional stuff he's going through, and those are more fiction, you know, through montage, through music and and fiction filmmaking to to get you to a place like when he first got on Gus for the very first time. That's a minute and a half sequence, but it took us three days to shoot. But then at the same time, there's moments with Lily is real time and him training horses is real time. So you could engage in his life both in a, in a documentary way almost, but also w in a fictional way that you can emo understand that emotional truth he's feeling. Mm -hmm. we, we see the, uh, it looks like you spent a lot of time with Brady or more than say a conventional shoot. I, I mean, maybe there are tricks, you know, maybe you were doing things out of sequence, but it seems like he's got enough time for his hair to grow back in for like the uh, maybe that's out of sequence movie magic. But uh, the uh, but I know that you basically lived with, uh, you know, your characters for a, an amount of time, too. I'm curious, uh, you know, as as sort of like a researcher, that is something that um, you kind of have the luxury of doing. But also, you know, working with your collaborators, with Joshua, you know, kind of what time what type of commitment, I guess, you guys made to spending time there and really just uh, capturing the world that we see? The first film, a lot, spending time. This one, no, I wasn't living there uh, next to him. I visited. Yeah. Um, but this was much more in the conventional sense of filmmaking than my first one. Mm -hmm. We had a script. You know, I listened to it for a year, Brady told me his stories, and after the injury, more stories. He wrote a 65 pages script. Once somewhere will say Brady train horses. That's ten minutes in the film, <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a dialogue scripted scene. Um, so yeah, and Josh, you wanna? Yeah, Josh, tell us about what it was like. Sort of, uh, and this is one of the things that's so amazing about this is it's so far off the beaten path. What was it like, Brady? Can you pass Josh your mic? Um, just my experience. Yeah, yeah, like and also kind of. It, I mean, there's something. There's something a little. It's not crazy, but really special and unique about you know kind of going so far off the grid to find this special story. Yeah, I mean Chloe would um, often go to the reservation on a trip on her own, and she would come back, you know, beaming, saying, "I've I've met this kid. I don't know what it is about him, but I saw him breaking these horses, and I don't know. I think uh, the camera's going to love him." <laughs> and um, and I went. I I met you, Braid, at that funeral, and I agreed and. It kind of sounds messed up, but you know, it was after the injury that we just felt, you know, we had to come and tell Brady's story and kind of be a part of his recovery. I think as well as friends, and this it just kind of grew out of that. I mean, from my point of view, the chance to go out and shoot there again 
I, you know, I'd do it again tomorrow. You know, and I think after our first feature together, there was other things that we wanted to, we felt we'd missed out on somehow. It's such a beautiful, nuanced place, and you could just, I mean, there's so many more features that could be made there, and, you know, hopefully more and more filmmakers feel urged to do, to do so. Tell us just about the light. I haven't seen a movie that looks like this ever. I mean, are you, is that magic hour? Is that your magic? I don't know, like, how do you make a movie like look like this, you know, it just kind of glows. Well, I think that's having a director that allows you to do that. You know, there, there's sacrifices Chloe would make in scheduling a film this way. You know, Josh, is, does the light look good? Yeah, I'm like, not really. <laughs> in like an hour and a half, she'd be like, okay, can we shoot something else? Yeah, let's go inside. And, and Chloe was flexible enough to do that. I think a lot of the light though, you just, it's because not many films are shot in the Badlands of South Dakota, mm -hmm. sadly. <laughs> I don't know why. Tax credit. <laughs> no, there's more than that. The, uh, uh, let, me, let me open it up to, to you guys, though, because I, I just want this to be you know, a, a, a more open conversation. Uh, do, do you have questions? Go ahead. I'll repeat it. You talk about the uh, character that you called my brother, which... Um, you mean Lane's character? The, the fellow who's where had. Right, right. Uh, would you talk a little bit about Lane and your relationship with him? Um, me and Lane Scott have been best friends since I was two and he was three, literally inseparable growing up. Um, you know, same sports all throughout school. Um, if, if he was at his house, I was there and vice versa. Uh, traveled all over the United States rodeoing together and uh, riding bulls and, you know, riding Bronx and working, breaking horses. Um, pretty much... Uh, each other's shadow growing up. <laughs> but was the kind of uh, interaction that you had in a rehab really very real? Had nothing. Chloe was like, okay, so do something that you would do normally when you go visit Lane. You know, it's not, I, I visited him, you know, tried to visit him at least once every month or so. It seems like a good example of one of these scenes that's practically documentary. It's just sort of you two being yourselves right on camera. There are some, because Lane was acting as well. He's a member of the cast, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, so there's a lot of genuine emotions between them. But he came up with lines and stuff, like the jokes, and, and so that to add a dimension. The, the version I w told him about the dialogue is a little more somber, and he, he had the, the jokes about rub some dirt in it and things like that. So uh, he's a showman. <laughs> And did you really got a tattoo of him on your back? Yeah, that's there. I mean, that, that's... I was actually getting this tattoo, and Catelyn is actually giving this tattoo to me while we're acting. In the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's commitment. It's like Robert De Niro doesn't I, do I was going to get this tattoo before, so and Chloe helped <laughs> me out with it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Here, I'll give you the mic since you're so oh, close. Okay. Anyway, uh, I just want to express my admiration for the director because I saw the movie two weeks ago in Paris, the first time, and this is my second time, and it still moved, it still moves me to tear. And uh, I, my question is, uh, I don't know if you know the movie, the Iranian movie uh, called Close Up. It's also based on a real event and uh, portrayed by real people. And your movie reminds me a lot of that. And uh, I think it's remarkable. It feels so real, and uh, because it's real event and mostly real event, and it's just. I just, it's just astonishing to me that it's also a documentary, but also a drama, and uh, I just love it. I guess Thank there's no, you. there's wasn't really a question there, I'm Thank sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you, I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very <laughs> much. Well, Chloe, maybe it's an opportunity to talk about maybe some of your influences or inspirations. You mentioned Kiristami's close-up, yeah. but uh, like what other filmmakers have kind of um, inspired your, your own style? Um. Obviously, Terrence Malick, you know, <laughs> he's pretty clear. Um, the Wong Kar Wai is pretty much the reason why I wanted to make films. Um, Werner Herzog, his philosophy of filmmaking. And Josh, you got some for me as well? Well, I, I was the one sometimes forcing Chloe to watch Westerns. Because <laughs> I, I grew up with a lot of Westerns. That, you know, that's, uh, yes, he watched a lot of Westerns. I um, have you know, them too. Chloe, yeah. I mean, that was interesting because she was just approaching it as a, a human story about a friend of hers. Um, but, you know, there were a few kind of 
geeky Western <laughs> references that. Um, okay, it's the searcher's shot. I get it. Okay, go do it. Then yeah. we can do that. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> there was a reason, but yeah. <laughs> How did you get that shot where he's writing and you're writing alongside him? It's like he's flying or something. Oh man, I mean that was a mixture of you, Brady. Find we'd, we'd say, is there a smooth bit of road where you can see the Badlands in the background? And Brady say, yeah, like right by a house. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> and then I had a really great um, grip who was also our gaffer and also our AC, and he. Um, just ratchet strapped the camera to the back of a pickup truck, and that was the shot. Yeah. Would you talk, to, uh, since we brought you up here too, you know, like sure. the, uh, and we're kind of talking <laughs> about the, uh, you know, this line that exists between, you know, a, a 65 page script leaves a lot of room yeah. for building things once you've kind of captured them. The, uh, would you talk to us a little bit about, especially some of the montages? There are moments like there's a jump in time, kind of a, a few months where his hair grows in, and, you yeah. know, the, uh, but uh, just, you know, that collaboration. Totally. I think, like, the biggest thing was that we saw, I tell, I, like, immediately. So, so we were like, okay, we're making the same movie. I think we very quickly realized the way this movie was shot, unlike other films. Like, there's sort of a fluidity in the time and sort of almost like a dreamlike state. So when you have footage like that, it kind of allows you to break kind of more conventional rules of continuity, of time, of that sort of thing. So for instance, if you notice, like Brady is never wearing the same shirt. He's never wearing the same like handkerchief. Like we're just kind of like, hopefully people won't notice yeah. <laughs> when he walks out and then he walks in the rehab, it's like 20 days later or whatever. <laughs> But I think that's the to like the power of the, the story that kind of Chloe and Brady and Joshua shaped is that you're so engrossed in the film, we kind of just like we're really able to pick, like pick the best moments and let the story kind of its momentum carry you forward. So with the stuff like with the you know the injury, kind of there was just this moment like we want to. We want to kind of give you a glimpse into like the boredom of what this injury is like, you know, when you're healing, and then kind of put you out on the other side, and then that's when we meet Lane. It's sort of like, okay, let's carry us through this this kind of boredom period. And then we're gonna meet this character, who is kind of like both an inspiration but also kind of a cautionary tale, I think, for Brady. And I think that's when the narrative we kind of like launch you forward into kind of rehabilitation and riding horses again and stuff like that. Brady, to go back to Lane for a second, I'm curious because this, you know, is his actual condition and it is, you know, a cautionary tale. The, the, for the narrative, for the movie, those are the stakes. You know, it's like if you get back on a horse again, if anybody gets on a horse, that can happen to them. I mean, what, philosophically, what is it like to have seen that happen to your best friend and what does it tell you about any any kid, you know, or yourself wanting to rodeo again? Uh, yeah, um, it, it never comes out and directly says how Lane was injured. Um, the speculation is that it's a rodeo injury. Uh, Lane was actually injured in a car accident. Uh, uh, he was in uh, Hillsboro, Texas on a full ride rodeo scholarship to ride bulls. And uh, yeah, he got injured in a car accident down there. And, uh, he was in a coma for a long time. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, rodeo can be s just so dangerous. Uh, not only rodeo, just working with horses in general. It's just like through your connection, you can you can predict so much, but um, there's a lot that's left to the element, so to speak. You know, so um, there's always a price to pay. Uh, you just gotta you gotta count your cards and you know play them the right way. That makes me realize you have maybe the worst rodeo injury in your community. Is that the case? I mean, like, are you surrounded by... Uh, there, there's there's people who, you know, aren't around to tell their story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More more questions. I see a woman on the aisle there. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I thought uh, your movie portrayed so beautifully the, the uh, strength of the human spirit. And it's a testament to you, Brady, I think. And I'm just wondering 
how much of it, um, as a director perhaps is my question, and to the actor, is, is pre-planned. I mean, to me, I, I saw you coming alive as the film progressed. And maybe you touched a little bit on it with the boredom aspect, I'm not sure. Um, but I was riveted from the beginning throughout to the end. But I'm just wondering, was that something you planned sort of technically as a director, or did it just sort of evolve that way as you were working on it? It was beautiful to watch the, the, the change. Did everybody hear the question, or do you want me to? Perfect. So to, to boil it down, the question is sort of like, I guess, as we see the evolution of Brady's character and attitude, like how much of that is scripted and how much of it is, is real um, th or is happening kind of like parallel with the movie? Uh, the movie was shot basically completely out of sequence. Uh, uh, like I think we started with scene number like 74 or something. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, Right, so it sounds like, for instance, you shaved your head afterwards and yeah, recreated um, well, a wound afterwards. For all of the beginning scenes were shot at the very end. Yeah. So. Yeah, but your question is, like, it's, I mean, I have Chloe answer, but it's like, it's the thing that's so amazing to me. I mean, I've seen a jillion movies, and it's like, the, somehow, I, that spell of, like, where does reality begin, it's like, I keep wanting to imagine that this movie is somehow less constructed than it is, and it's really your, your work on it. My answer isn't going to be that exciting. <laughs> just to put it out there. Um, the I really wish I had a better answer for this and it been asked before. But going into it is looking at it as a traditional fictional film. It's a, it's a, there's a true event that happened. Um, it's inspired by a true event. And you do your research, you talk to the person, and you write a script. Um, and I'm, it just happened. I'm casting the person the true event is inspired by to play that role. So the fiction there's a script for 65 pages. And then uh, going in, casting everybody within that community, uh, to and then writing the roles for them. And um, um, I shoot the film very much so like a fictional film. You know, he's got his couple of sheets of script, in, you know, at the beginning of the day, and we look at it. Uh, and there are scenes, obviously, that are improvised. But, and then also, after it's over, finding that in the editing room, which to me is just as important as the screenwriting process when you shoot this way. Um, a lot of great filmmakers work this, like a lot of, I admire filmmakers who've been working this way for a long time. But ultimately, I think Brady's own story in real life, to me, is a very hopeful one. And there's so much strength in Brady and in someone like Lane. You know, even Lily, like in these young people's lives that they just, they, they go through so much at such a young age, and they're so strong, and uh, that's just gonna come across naturally. That conversation that, there's that conversation that kind of distills the movie after he has to put down the horse, you know, w between him and his sister. That was something that you said that Brady, you know, articulated himself though. It's a, you know, it's another sign of just, part of this is l observing, listening, being curious. One of the first times I, I really talked to her about, you know, I was already training horses again without really telling her much about it. <laughs> she she called me to chew me out, and uh, you know, I told her, you know, I don't I don't feel alive not riding, Chloe. You know, she's like, but you could die. I was like, well, it, I'm not really living anyway. I don't feel like, you know, and, um, I'm not the person to stick their hand out, and I had to find some way to make a living, which wasn't working at a grocery store. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, like Apollo happened before, actually before my injury, and uh, that was a that's a true story. Uh, Apollo was uh, played by another horse because he passed away already. Obviously, I guess. Uh, and yeah. The that thing with your hand is that something that actually happened, or is that you know sort of an embellishment? Um, I had some uh, some motor skill difficulties after the injury. Um, they were hard to capitalize by on camera, and one thing. Uh, the step actually didn't knock me unconscious. After I arrived at the hospital, they started asking me a series of questions, and I went into a full-body convulsion seizure. And uh, they induced coma and did surgery. But um, I was put on seizure medic anti-seizure medication afterwards, and uh, that was uh, a visual way to put put it on screen. Yeah. Uh, here, I'm going to look on this other side because I keep focusing over there. Let's grab from the other aisle. Go ahead. 
Yes, please. I, I can't see your gender just because of the lighting, so go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so what, Chloe, this is for you, what took you to the Badlands? I mean, how did you, from wherever you came from, whatever your history is, how did you get there? What drew you there? So tell us a little bit about your background and how you found your way to the Badlands, to uh, the reservation. Uh, I'm from Beijing, I'm Chinese. Um, and um, I, I spent a lot of time in big cities my whole life. I never really lived in a, in a small town or anywhere like that. But um, at that time, I remember I was in my late 20s. I have to make, a f I, it's time to make my thesis film at school. I just didn't feel like it was in New York. And I, was, I just wasn't sure what kind of storyteller I am and, and just a lot of noises around me. And historically, when you're confused, you, you know, or you're searching for something, you go west. <laughs> uh, so I took out the compass, no, but I, um, I think the plains make sense to me because I'm scared of the ocean, I'm, I'm not sure about the mountains or the desert. <laughs> and the plains sounds good. And, and also coming from Beijing, having fantasizing about Inner Mongolia, having seen, listened to music from that, seeing image from it. Um, and you go to a, a place like Pine Ridge, you know, even the land is such a ranching culture. You know, it's not like it's farming. The land hasn't even been touched. Uh, you really, you can probably find the bones of a dead animal that's been there for a long time. And, and in a t in a era where everything's so fast and transient, it's incredibly uh, grounding to be in a place like that. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's it's cool. Like uh, Chloe went to NYU. As this is something I've noticed, with, like directors like Joshua Marsden, who made Maria Full of Grace, and Kerry Fukunaga, who did Sin Nombre, and Sean Baker, who did you know the Florida Project. Where it's like they must teach you there. I don't know if this is true, but it's my impression to like go and find your story and to to turn that into it, to take something real and and to dramatize it because each of those projects is one where you know it's like it's not generic. It's not uh, invented from, but it's really about someone uh, being anthropological almost in, in looking for, you know, poetry in real life. And we, uh, I don't feel like I've ever seen this story or this place before, except in your first film, you know, the, uh, but is, is that true? Is that like the, is that sort of the dogma of, uh, of NYU or is that sort of also your, uh, uh, did you also, Joshua, go to NYU? Uh, the, or is that something more that comes out of you? I think it's more like they teach you the tools. Like they get, because we have to learn everything from editing to how to turn on the sound machine, whatever things are called. <laughs> but <laughs> I did not do well in that class. But we learned, <laughs> <laughs> or I don't think if I, I even went. But I, I think, let's just say they give us the tools to, to try to, to go at it this way, which yeah. is a bit crazy, you know, sometimes. But, but you kind of know what everyone needs to do to, 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 you don't rely on a bigger thing. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And I also think whatever people say about film schools in general, there's a lot at stake when you sign up for the grad film course at NYU, just the, the fees alone. Yeah. So <laughs> definitely. So it attracts a certain kind of person. And I think it attracts people um, like Chloe and, and Kerry for Kanaga and people who are determined to become filmmakers before they even step in the door. Mm -hmm. So, and it creates an environment for that to flourish, I think. Brady, your journey has been kind of the opposite. So Chloe, you know, Beijing, London, Los Angeles, New York, that's, you know, kind of like where she came to Pine Ridge from. Uh, you sort of, through this movie, have had a passport beyond kind of what your world was before. How has that journey been for you? Well, I haven't been to Beijing yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you were saying Anytime. you just went to Paris. Yeah, uh, I just got back from Paris not too long ago. I've been to New York twice, been to L.A. twice now. Uh, I've been all over. What's that yeah. been like? I mean, like the because one of the things that we see on film is your world is this kind of, it's kind of contained in, in what we see, you know, and it's sort of opened up since then. Uh, you know, I mean, when I was traveling on the rodeo circuit, I was all over the sure. United yeah. States. Uh, but uh, it's it's a little different, but there's still a metaphorical Bronx stride, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The okay, we've got just a few more minutes, so a couple, a couple questions. How how long did you shoot? 
Uh, September 3rd to October 9th of 2016. What was the material you shot on, Joshua? Oh, uh, we shot on the uh, Lexa, uh, the Amira. So a digital uh, yeah. camera? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, all right, I'm going to go way into the dark there. There's someone enthusiastically waving your hand. Okay, actually, on behalf of another enthusiastic person, one of you decide and speak up. Hey, Chloe. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, Mount Holyoke. Mount Holyoke. Oh, 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 wow. <laughs> I went to Mount Holyoke for college. It's a woman's college in Massachusetts. Yeah, I can tell you. Maybe you remember me. <laughs> um, are you still planning to shoot in South Dakota for your uh, future films? Or um, are you going to, what are your plans for the future in terms of your filming? So is this the end of your relationship with the Dakotas, or will you be doing more there? Not immediately. Um, the next film is set in the 1800s, so uh, <laughs> it is uh, in, uh, more in the Indian territory in the 1800s, so it's current day Oklahoma. But we'll probably have to shoot in Romania or something, too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, I know, and also it would be nice, and Josh can say this, like, it would be nice to go back for once, not be making a movie. <laughs> just hide out, you know. Um, um, but in the future, there's I definitely have a belief in the three. You know, I think there's a there's a third one, a trilogy to be to be uh, completed. Can you tell us anything more about that next film that you just were right. giving us details? For? And it's, a, it's about U.S. Uh, Deputy Marshal Bass Reeves, who is a, a black marshal who who uh, um, escaped slavery and went to Indian Territory after the Civil War and mm -hmm. lived among Native Americans and is actually one of the greatest lawmen in our, our history. How did you stumble across this story? Did someone come to you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I <laughs> we were looking at just something in that era and was researching actually my DP is the one said, have you heard of Bass Reeves? Like, now no, I have. Yeah, <laughs> now I, I have, yeah. The, uh, all right, the, uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, let's hang out afterwards, and you can tell me Chloe's stories, though. I want to know what she was like at Mount Holyoke. No, I'm kidding. Oh, I'm no, kidding. you don't want to. <laughs> the, uh, all right, tell all your friends. This is the kind of movie that really needs your support. Yes, uh, please. Thank you. The, uh, thank you for staying.